Oops. All right. Welcome, everybody. I know it's been quite a while, but here is um, one of our last few lessons for this school year. Um, it's time we talked about gene regulation. So let's talk about why it's important. So first of all, um, I hope you love my PowerPoint art here. Um, let's say that you're sitting down to a meal and like this nice young stick person here, you're eating some spaghetti. You're going to hopefully use a fork or some similar tool in order to eat it because, you know, it's spaghetti. That's what you eat spaghetti with. On the other hand, let's say you sit down with a nice bowl of soup. Would you be able to use that fork to eat it with or would you need a different tool? Hopefully you are not eating your soup with a fork because I don't think that would be very effective. Instead, you need a different tool for it. Um, luckily, we are able to like, you know, go to the kitchen and pick out this tool or, you know, go wherever, you know, in the restaurant and pick up this tool. But if you're a single celled organism, it's not as easy as that. So let's look at a single celled organism. This is your stereotypical bacterium. Um, if it's surrounded by a bunch of glucose, then that is going to be what it uses as its fuel source. So it's going to produce enzymes that match that glucose and are able to break it down so that it can get energy from them. On the other hand, if that bacterium is surrounded by a different fuel so source, in this case, we have some disaccharide, um, how would that uh, bacterium be able to digest it? Uh, you should remember that enzymes are very highly specific. If you look at this guy right here, look at its active site. Its active site is shaped to specifically fit a glucose molecule. None of the other molecules in the environment will be able to be catalyzed properly by that enzyme. So if you just keep producing the same enzyme that was used to catalyze glucose, you're not going to be able to break down this new food source. So you need to be able to adapt as an organism and produce a different enzyme. You produce a different enzyme that is capable of breaking down this new food source, then you are better able to um, utilize whatever food sources you have in your environment, which gives you a reproductive advantage over all your competitors in the environment. Now, why don't we just have all of our enzymes expressed all the time? Well, energy is limited. It's not like every organism has a, a huge buffet out there waiting for them. So they have to spend their energy very judiciously. They have to be very careful about how they use it. Um, and so what they need to do is only make the tools they need at that time. It would be like if every time you used a fork or a spoon, you had to pay a tax or you had to pay a certain amount. Well, you wouldn't get a fork, a spoon, a knife, and five other different eating utensils uh, every time you eat because if you did, you'd be wasting a lot of money. Instead, you would just get the specific tool you need for the specific food you're eating. And that's kind of what these uh, bacteria are doing. Similarly, all of us, um, every single organism on the planet has to regulate how its genes are expressed. And this can be ranged from fairly simple, which we'll look at first in prokaryotes, to pretty darn complex, which we'll look at in eukaryotes next. So prokaryotes have a bit of a, a shortcut to being able to control their genes, what they have are these units called operons. So operons are a segment of DNA on their chromosome. Remember, prokaryotes have one single circular chromosome, and it contains a regulatory DNA sequence that can be regulated by molecules in the environment. It contains a promoter, which is where RNA polymerase binds, and then it also contains several related genes. So one of the most uh, famous, well-studied, and um, often explained operons is the LAC operon, which is used to digest lactose. So lactose is the sugar that's found in milk, and unless lactose is present in the environment and there is no glucose in the environment, bacteria usually don't make the enzymes that they need in order to digest it because there's no lactose present. It's, it's basically a waste of time and energy. On the other hand, let's say that a bacterial cell finds itself in an environment where there is no glucose and its only food source is lactose. Um, it, what it can do is with a single... Uh, signaling episode, it can turn on all the genes it needs to activate all of the enzymes it needs in order to digest lactose, and it can produce those fairly quickly and very quickly take advantage of a different food source. 
A lot of these have uh, accessory proteins that go along with them. That's what the regulatory gene will produce. A lot of times it will produce either a repressor or it can produce an activator depending on the specific operon that you're looking at. And that activator or repressor is going to affect how RNA polymerase binds. Um, a repressor is going to block RNA polymerase from attaching to the promoter and being able to transcribe the genes, so you're not going to make that product. Uh, an activator, on the other hand, is going to make it more likely the RNA polymerase can bind and make it more likely those genes are transcribed and translated and then protein products made. So, like I said, Activators and repressors are involved in helping to regulate gene expression. They bind to either the promoter or the operator in order to affect how RNA polymerase binds. Activators also have these other molecules that are associated with them called inducers, which can bind to and increase the activity of an activator or make it more likely that it's going to attach to the promoter or operator in the operon. Co-repressors are molecules that help out repressors. So um, a lot of times you'll have repressors that are floating around. They may not be activated, but in the presence of a specific molecule called a co-repressor, it'll change their shape enough that they can attach to the operon and then actively repress transcription of genes. So there are two major types of operons that you see. They're inducible and repressible. Induce means to make happen. If you have trouble remembering that, think about when uh, a woman has labor induced. So if a woman's pregnant, she's past her due date, or something happens where they need the baby to be born before whatever natural point childbirth would occur, they can induce or they can make labor happen. An inducible operon is one that you can turn on. So normally it is off, it is not expressed, and it needs to be turned on. You can do this in one of two ways. It could be normally turned off because it normally has a repressor there. So that's what happens in the case of the LAC operon. There is a repressor that is always bound, uh, and when it's bound, RNA polymerase cannot bind and cannot start transcribing the genes. On the other hand, when a co when a um, when a allolactose molecule, which is an isomer or rearranged form of lactose is present, it binds to the receptor or the repressor, and then it changes its shape so that it's no longer bound to the operon. And when it's gone, that removes this um, repression of the lac operon so RNA polymerase can go and start making all those proteins, start transcribing it. So LAC operons are inducible, and they're kind of our general model for what an inducible operon is. However, there's always the possibility on the AP test that they'll throw some other operon at you, and if they tell you that it's inducible, you need to know it's normally turned off, and it needs some sort of molecule that's going to either inactivate a repressor or that's going to activate an activator, something that's going to turn on expression of those genes. The opposite is a repressible operon. You know, if you repress something, you hold it down or you keep it from happening. So a repressible operon is normally on and you have to turn it off when you no longer need it to function. So uh, when you have the stereotypical operon like this, it's called the trip operon because it is involved in making tryptophan. Tryptophan is one of your amino acids that is used to build proteins, and each of these five enzymes are needed in the pathway that makes them. When you have sufficient tryptophan, you don't want to waste energy making more tryptophan because you could use that energy to make something else that you need. So when tryptophan is present, it becomes a co-repressor because it binds to the repressor and allows the repressor to attach to the operator. And it blocks the operation of RNA polymerase, which blocks transcription of those genes. So repressible operon is turned off by certain circumstances. If you don't have tryptophan, that repressor has a different shape. It is not able to bind to the operator, and you just have constant transcription of these sets of genes. So it's a very good way to, uh, to regulate which genes you have turned on, which genes you have turned off.
though unfortunately it gets more complicated in eukaryotes as everything does and you get things like this so eukaryotic gene expression is controlled by a bunch of what are called transcription factors these are molecules that bind to dna they usually have very specific sequences they bind to uh, they have to be in the right shape in order to bind and they can either make it uh, easier for RNA polymerase to bind to a promoter, or they can make it harder for RNA polymerase to bind. On its own, without a transcription factor, RNA polymerase does not have what's called a high affinity, meaning a high attraction or a, you know ability to bind to DNA. But these transcription factors, when you start adding them to form this, what's called a transcription initiation complex, which is what uh, this guy is right here. It's a transcription initiation complex. And once you have one of these assembled, that's going to dramatically increase the affinity or the binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter region. And that is going to allow you to transcribe those genes. Notice that we have a bunch of different transcription factors. Some of them are general transcription factors, and these are just involved in the transcription of most of the genes in the genome. However, you do have some specific transcription factors which are going to turn on specific sets of genes. They'll have particular sequences that they bind to, and you can turn on or activate these transcription factors um, or make them active by you know, doing things like phosphorylating them, which is uh, one thing that signaling molecules tend to do. So it's the combination of those transcription factors that's gonna determine one, whether transcription is happening, and two, how much of it is happening. So we're gonna talk about a lot of these different elements. So you have two different flavors of uh, transcription factors. You have activators. They're going to increase RNA polymerase binding and make it easier for RNA polymerase to start transcribing. And then you have repressors, which are going to decrease. So for example, in this diagram on the right, you see an activator, that activator, um, can be blocked, though, by a repressor, and that repressor can prevent the activator from binding and allowing RNA polymerase to bind. Here you have a repressor acting in a, in a different manner. It seems like it's almost holding on to this uh, transcription initiation complex and keeping it from moving. So it's not going to move. RNA polymerase is not going to be moved able to move along the DNA strand, and it's not going to be able to make a copy, a transcript, or an mRNA from that, pro from that DNA. There are a number of different regulatory sequences that are involved in turning up or turning down transcription of a gene. So uh, some of these are um, described here. There are a few that are usually close to the promoter, which is right before the uh, gene itself. So here you have a series of exons and introns and exons and introns. That is your actual gene transcript that's going to be transcribed into RNA. Then the region just upstream or just before that is the promoter, and this is always where RNA polymerase binds. You have some what are called proximal control elements. Proximal means it's close to, it's like in close proximity. And uh, these are control elements that will allow the transcription factors to bind to help regulate whether or not RNA polymerase can attach to the promoter. Then you'll have what are called distal control elements, which you can think of as distant. Um, you can have some enhancers that can be thousands of nu uh, nucleotides away from the actual gene itself. Uh, they're, a lot of times they're upstream of the gene, and they will be able to bind to activators and cofactors and things like that to help form the transcription initiation complex. One thing that you saw on this slide is the enhancers up here. And notice that you have to bend the DNA in order to allow the enhancer to get close enough that it can be part of helping form the transcription initiation complex. Uh, 
All right. So what is the promoter? It's where transcription is started, where it's initiated. Um, and like I said, it's just upstream of the promoter. There are some elements that are common to the promoter, one of which I, for some reason, always remember. It's the TATA -ta box. It's got TATA -ta in the sequence, and that's very commonly found in a lot of promoters. Um, and then you have to have something that's going to show when you need to stop transcribing. And that is usually a transcription sequence, I mean, a terminator sequence that's going to uh, basically uh, reduce the affinity of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase will uh, detach from the DNA and it will release the RNA transcript. So enhancers are these regions of DNA that are not usually close to the gene. They can be very far away and they allow activators to bind to help get uh, the transcription initiation uh, complex form. Um, regulatory genes are genes that are going to produce either repressors or activators and they can be close to the gene or in eukaryotes, they can be very far from the gene because what you see here is a prokaryotic operon, but you do have regulatory genes in eukaryotic genomes. You also have another level of control you can have by uh, producing these regulatory RNA sequences. It turns out only a small portion of our genome actually codes for protein producing sequences. Instead, you have a lot of sequences that produce what are called microRNAs or smaller RNAs. And these RNAs actually have a role in regulating whether a specific gene is transcribed or whether it's not. Um, actually, more of a role in, in uh, controlling translation. So here in this diagram, what you see is there's a microRNA gene. It produces a specific uh, RNA that then gets processed and cut up to form what's called a microRNA that then attaches to a protein. And that protein and RNA complex is going to either block translation, which can be reversible, or depending on how well it fits, it could signal for that RNA to be degraded. And if that RNA is degraded and broken down, it's no longer translated, you're not getting any protein made out of it. There are also some regulatory RNA sequences found within the RNA transcript itself. So we did talk about, or you did have a question that was talking about how some of the introns in a gene also have a little bit of catalytic activity to help them get spliced out. Uh, and then we'll talk more about some of the other RNAs. So there is a technique called RNA interference that your, not only do your cells use, but it's actually something that can be used in experiments to help uh, control gene expression so that you can see whether or not a, uh, a protein, what the effect is if a protein is not produced. So they're either microRNAs or what are called small interfering RNAs or siRNAs. They are complementary to a specific mRNA sequence and they are either going to provide temporary control to let you stop uh, translating that RNA sequence in the short term, or they can signal for degrading that mRNA. So it allows you to have very precise control of, okay, we're going to translate this RNA, this mRNA, but we're going to translate it for an hour, and then we're going to shut it off so that no more protein is being made. There is, uh, There are some hypotheses that uh, this is uh, a feature of the mammalian immune system that was originally developed in order to break down uh, double-stranded RNA that was found in viruses that infect cells. However, there is more evidence now that it is actually a um, not just used for immune defense. It may also just be used for normal regulation of gene expression. Regulating gene expression is important in multicellular organisms for uh, a much different reason. Parts of your genome are expressed in each of your different cell types, and it may not be the same parts of the genome. So for example, if you have a neuron, your neuronal cells are going to express different genes than say a skin cell. A skin cell would need to produce the protein keratin quite a bit, whereas a brain cell would need to produce, uh, would need to produce a channel protein. And 
you don't want to produce those channel proteins in a skin cell and you don't want to produce keratin in a brain cell because they would interfere with the function of that cell. So you need to have very specific control of which genes are expressed in which cell type. And in fact, that's what's responsible for what we call differentiation. The process by which cells, as they go through development of a, uh, an embryo, they start to take on a specific fate and they start to become more and more specialized until they become a very specific cell type. And the way this is done is by activating or inactivating uh, a lot of genes. So there's going to be a certain set of genes expressed in a specific cell type. So each cell type has this unique combination of activators and repressors. And depending on which ones are expressed in that cell type, that's going to help determine which genes are expressed in that cell type. There are some general transcription factors that are just involved in um, basal levels of uh, transcription, and they are generalized, meaning they can work on a lot of different a lot of different genes, but then it's the specific transcription factors that are going to kind of provide that variation in gene expression between different cell types. So uh, this is an image that looks very similar to one that was in your chapter reading. So there are two different genes here, albumin, sorry, and crystalline. Crystalline is found in the lens of uh, made by lens cells in the eye. And like its name says, it's made, made to form the crystalline structure of the lens of your eyeball. You don't want to make crystalline in a liver cell though, because a liver cell uh, doesn't need to have this hard crystal structure in it that's used to bend light. Instead, it makes a protein called albumin. Uh, you don't want to make albumin in a lens cell though, because it's not going to help you be able to see any better. So both cell types have both genes. They have an albumin gene and they have a crystalline gene. But based on the specific activators and repressors they have, in liver cells, the activators that are available will turn on transcription of albumin, but they will not turn on transcription of crystalline. In the lens cell, you have a different set of activators and repressors that do not act to increase transcription of albumin. However, they do encourage transcription of crystalline. So based on the specific transcription factors you have, you're going to turn on specific genes and that's going to cause your cells to differentiate. Our next lesson is going to be on mutations. And then after that, the only possible one that we might have is one on DNA technology. Although I'm going to try and look for already produced videos that have animations that show you how those work. So that way you can understand how they're used in experiments and be able to interpret those experiments for your FRP.